Chapter 8 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 8 Flying Machines How to Operate. Anyone who has learned to ride a bicycle will recall the great difficulty at first experienced to preserve equilibrium. But once the knack was gained, how simple the matter seemed. Balancing became a second nature, which came into play instinctively, without conscious thought or effort. On smooth roads it was not even necessary to grasp the handlebars. The swaying of the body was sufficient to guide the machine in the desired direction. Much of this experience is paralleled by that of the would-be aviator. First, he must acquire the art of balancing himself and his machine in the air without conscious effort. Unfortunately, this is even harder than in the case of the bicycle. The cases would be more nearly alike if the road beneath and ahead of the bicyclist were heaving and falling as in an earthquake, with no light to guide him. For the air currents on which the aviator must ride are in constant and irregular motion, and are as wholly invisible to him as would be the road at night to the rider of the wheel. And there are other things to distract the attention of the pilot of an aeroplane, notably the roar of the propeller, and the rush of wind in his face, comparable only to the ceaseless and breathtaking force of the hurricane. The well-known aviator, Charles K. Hamilton, says, So far as the air currents are concerned, I rely entirely on instinctive action, but my ear is always on the alert. The danger signal of the aviator is when he hears his motor miss an explosion. Then he knows that trouble is in store. Sometimes he can speed up his engine, just as an automobile driver does, and get it to renew its normal action. But if he fails in this, and the motor stops, he must dip his deflecting planes and try to negotiate a landing in open country. Sometimes there is no preliminary warning from the motor that it is going to cease working. That is the time when the aviator must be prepared to act quickly. Unless the deflecting planes are manipulated instantly, aviator and aeroplane will rapidly land a tangled mass on the ground. At the same time, Mr. Hamilton says, driving an aeroplane at a speed of 120 miles an hour is not nearly so difficult a task as driving an automobile 60 miles an hour. In running an automobile at high speed, the driver must be on the job every second. Nothing but untiring vigilance can protect him from danger. There are turns in the road, bad stretches of pavement, and other like difficulties, and he can never tell at what moment he is to encounter some vehicle, perhaps traveling in the opposite direction. But with an aeroplane, it is a different proposition. Once a man becomes accustomed to aeroplaning, it is a matter of unconscious attention. He has no obstacles to encounter except cross-currents of air. Air and wind are much quicker than a man can think and put his thought into action. Unless experience has taught the aviator to maintain his equilibrium instinctively, he is sure to come to grief. The Wright brothers spent years in learning the art of balancing in the air before they appeared in public as aviators and their method of teaching pupils is evidence that they believe the only road to successful aviation is through progressive experience, leading up from the use of gliders for short flights to the actual machines with motors only after one has become an instinctive equilibrist. At the Plum Island School of the Herring Burgess Company, the learner is compelled to begin at the beginning and work the thing out for himself. He is placed in a glider which rests on the ground. The glider is locked down by a catch which may be released by pulling a string. To the front end of the glider is attached a long elastic which may be stretched more or less according to the pull desired. The beginner starts with the elastic stretched but a little. When all is ready he pulls the catch free and is thrown forward for a few feet. As practice gains for him better control, he makes a longer flight, and when he can show a perfect mastery of his craft for a flight of 300 feet, and not till then, he is permitted to begin practice with a motor-driven machine. The lamented Otto Lilienthal, whose experience in more than 2,000 flights gives his instructions unquestionable weight, urges that the gradual development of flight should begin with the simplest apparatus and movements, and without the complication of dynamic means. With simple wing surfaces, man can carry out limited flights, by gliding through the air from elevated points in paths more or less descending. The peculiarities of wind effects can best be learned by such exercises. The maintenance of equilibrium in forward flight is a matter of practice, and can be learned only by repeated personal experiment. 
actual practice in individual flight presents the best prospects for developing our capacity until it leads to perfected free flight. The essential importance of thorough preparation in the school of experience could scarcely be made plainer or stronger. If it seems that undue emphasis has been laid upon this point, the explanation must be found in the deplorable death record among aviators from accidents in the air. With few exceptions, the cause of accident has been reported as, the aviator seemed to lose control of his machine. If this is the case with professional flyers, the need for thorough preliminary training cannot be too strongly insisted upon. Having attained the art of balancing, the aviator has to learn the mechanism by which he may control his machine. While all of the principal machines are but different embodiments of the same principles, there is a diversity of design in the arrangement of the means of control. We shall describe that of the Curtis biplane as largely typical of them all. In general, the biplane consists of two large sustaining planes, one above the other. Between the planes is the motor which operates a propeller located in the rear of the planes. Projecting behind the planes, and held by a framework of bamboo rods, is a small horizontal plane, called the tail. The rudder which guides the aeroplane to the right or the left is partially bisected by the tail. This rudder is worked by wires which run to a steering wheel located in front of the pilot's seat. This wheel is similar in size and appearance to the steering wheel of an automobile, and is used in the same way for guiding the aeroplane to the right or left. In front of the planes, supported on a shorter projecting framework, is the altitude rudder, a pair of planes hinged horizontally, so that their front edges may tip up or down. When they tilt up, the air through which the machine is passing catches on the undersides and lifts them up, thus elevating the front of the whole aeroplane and causing it to glide upward. The opposite action takes place when these altitude planes are tilted downward. This altitude rudder is controlled by a long rod which runs to the steering wheel. By pushing on the wheel, the rod is shoved forward and turns the altitude planes upward. Pulling the wheel turns the rudder planes downward. This rod has a backward and forward thrust of over two feet, but the usual movement in ordinary wind currents is rarely more than an inch. In climbing to high levels or swooping down rapidly, the extreme play of the rod is about four or five inches. Thus the steering wheel controls both the horizontal and vertical movements of the aeroplane. More than this, it is a feeler to the aviator, warning him of the condition of the air currents, and for this reason must not be grasped too firmly. It is to be held steady, yet loosely enough to transmit any wavering force in the air to the sensitive touch of the pilot, enabling him instinctively to rise or dip as the current compels. The preserving of an even keel is accomplished in the Curtis machine by small planes hinged between the main planes at the outer ends. They serve to prevent the machine from tipping over sideways. They are operated by arms, projecting from the back of the aviator's seat, which embrace his shoulders on each side, and are moved by the swaying of his body. In a measure, they are automatic in action, for when the aeroplane sags downward on one side, the pilot naturally leans the other way to preserve his balance, and that motion swings the ailerons, as these small stabilizing planes are called, in such a way that the pressure of the wind restores the aeroplane to an even keel. The wires which connect them with the back of the seat are so arranged that when one aileron is being pulled down at its rear edge, the rear of the other one is being raised, thus doubling the effect. As the machine is righted, the aviator comes back to an upright position, and the ailerons become level once more. There are other controls which the pilot must operate consciously. In the Curtis machine, these are levers moved by the feet. With a pressure of the right foot, he short-circuits the magneto, thus cutting off the spark in the engine cylinders and stopping the motor. This lever also puts a brake on the forward landing wheels and checks the speed of the machine as it touches the ground. The right foot also controls the pump which forces the lubricating oil faster or slower to the points where it is needed. The left foot operates the lever which controls the throttle by which the aviator can regulate the flow of gas to the engine cylinders. The average speed of the 7-foot propeller is 1,100 revolutions per minute. With the throttle, it may be cut down to 100 revolutions per minute, which is not fast enough to keep afloat, but will help along when gliding. Obviously, traveling with the wind enables the aviator to make his best speed records, for the speed of the wind is added to that of his machine through the air. Again, since the wind is always slower near the ground, the aviator making a speed record will climb up to a level where the surface currents no longer affect his machine. 
but over hilly and wooded country the air is often flowing or rushing in conflicting channels, and the aviator does not know what he may be called upon to face from one moment to the next. If the aeroplane starts to drop, it is only necessary to push the steering wheel forward a little, perhaps half an inch, to bring it up again. Usually the machine will drop on an even keel. Then, in addition to the motion just described, the aviator will lean toward the higher side, thus moving the ailerons by the seat back, and at the same time he will turn the steering wheel toward the lower side. This movement of the seat back is rarely more than two inches. In flying across country, a sharp lookout is kept on the land below. If it be of a character unfit for landing, as woods or thickly settled towns, the aviator must keep high up in the air, lest his engine stop and he be compelled to glide to the earth. A machine will glide forward three feet for each foot that it drops, if skillfully handled. If he is up 200 feet, he will have to find a landing ground within 600 feet. If he is up 500 feet, he may choose his alighting ground anywhere within 1,500 feet. Over a city like New York, a less altitude than 1,500 feet would hardly be safe if a glide became necessary. Mr. Clifford B. Harmon, who was an aeronaut of distinction before he became an aviator, under the instruction of Paul Han, has this to say. It is like riding a bicycle or running an automobile. You have to try it alone to really learn how. When one first handles a flying machine, it is advisable to keep on the ground, just rolling along. This is a harder mental trial than you will imagine. As soon as one is seated in a flying machine, he wishes to fly. It is almost impossible to submit to staying near the earth. But until the manipulation of the levers and the steering gear has become second nature, this must be done. It is best to go very slow in the beginning. Skipping along the ground will teach a driver much. When one first gets up in the air, it is necessary to keep far from all obstacles, like buildings, trees, or crowds. There is the same tendency to run into them that an amateur bicycle rider has in regard to stones and ruts on the ground. When he keeps his eye on them, and tries with all his might to steer clear of them, he runs right into them. When asked what he regarded the fundamental requirements in an aviator, Mr. Harmon said, First, he must be muscularly strong, so that he will not tire. Second, he should have a thorough understanding of the mechanism of the machine he drives. Third, mental poise, the ability to think quick and to act instantly upon your thought. Fourth, a feeling of confidence in the air, so that he will not feel strange or out of place. This familiarity with the air can be best obtained by first being a passenger in a balloon, then by controlling one alone, and lastly, going up in a flying machine. Mr. Claude Graham White, the noted English aviator, has this to say of his first experience with his big number 12, Bellario monoplane, which differs in many important features from the number 11 machine in which M. Bellario crossed the English Channel. After several disappointments, I eventually obtained the delivery of my machine in working order. As I had gathered a good deal of information from watching the antics and profiting by the errors made by other beginners on Blériot monoplanes, I had a good idea of what not to do when the engine was started up and we were ready for our first trial. It was a cold morning, but the engine started up at the first quarter turn. After many warnings from M. Blériot's foreman not to, on any account to accelerate my engine too much, I mounted the machine along with my friend as passenger, and immediately gave the word to let go, and we were soon speeding along the ground at a good sixty kilometers about thirty-seven miles per hour. Being very anxious to see whether the machine would lift off the ground, I gave a slight jerk to the elevating plane, and soon felt the machine rise into the air, but remembering the warnings of the foreman, and being anxious not to risk breaking the machine, I closed the throttle and contented myself with running around on the ground to familiarize myself with the handling of the machine. The next day we got down to Issy about five o'clock in the morning, some two hours before the Blériot machines turned up. However, we got the machine out and tied it to some railings, and then I had my first experience of starting an engine, which to a novice at first sight appears a most hazardous undertaking. For unless the machine is either firmly held by several men, or is strongly tied up, it has a tendency to immediately leap forward. We successfully started the engine, and then rigged up a leash, and when we had mounted the machine, we let go, and before eight o'clock we had accomplished several very successful flights, both with and against the wind. These experiences we continued throughout the day, and by nightfall I felt quite capable of an extended flight, if only the ground had been large enough. The following day M. Blériot returned, and he sent for me and strongly urged me not to use the airplane any more at Issy, as he said the ground was far too small for such a powerful machine. 
The caution shown by these experienced aviators cannot be too closely followed by a novice. These men do not say that their assiduous practice on the ground was the fruit of timidity. On the contrary, although they are long past the preliminary stages, their advice to beginners is uniformly in the line of caution and thorough practice. Even after one has become an expert, the battle is not won by any means. While flying in calm weather is extremely pleasurable, a protracted flight is very fatiguing. And when it is necessary to wrestle with gusts of high wind and fickle air currents, the strain upon the strongest nerve is a serious source of danger in that the aviator is liable to be suddenly overcome by weariness when he most needs to be on the alert. Engine troubles are much fewer than they used to be, and a more dependable form of motor relieves the mind of the aviator from such mental disturbance. Some device in the line of a windshield would be a real boon, for even in the best weather there is the ceaseless rush of air into one's face at 45 to 50 miles an hour. The endurance of this for hours is of itself a tax upon the most vigorous physique. With the passing of the present spectacular stage of the art of flying there will doubtless come a more reliable form of machine, with corresponding relief to the operator. Automatic mechanism will supplant the intense and continual mental attention now demanded, and as this demand decreases, the joys of flying will be considerably enhanced. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air » by Richard Ferris. Chapter 9. Flying Machines. How to Build. When Santos Dumont in 1909 gave to the world the unrestricted privilege of building monoplanes after the plans of his famous number 20, afterward named La Demoiselle, he gave not only the best he knew, but as much as anyone knows about the building of flying machines. Santos Dumont had chosen the monoplane for himself because his long experience commends it above others, and La Demoiselle was the crowning achievement of years spent in the construction and operation of airships of all types. In view of Santos Dumont's notable successes in his chosen field of activity, no one will go astray in following his advice. Of course, the possession of plans and specifications for an aeroplane does not make any man a skilled mechanic. It is well to understand at the start that a certain degree of mechanical ability is required in building a machine which will be entirely safe. Nor does the possession of a successful machine make one an aeronaut. As in the case of bicycling, there is no substitute for actual experience while in the airship the art of balancing is of even greater importance than on the bicycle. The would-be aviator is therefore advised to put himself through a course of training of mind and body. Intelligent experimenting with some one of the models described in Chapter 11 will teach much of the action of aeroplanes in calms and when winds are blowing, and practice with an easily constructed glider. See Chapter 12. We'll give experience in balancing, which will be of the greatest value when one launches into the air for the first time with a power-driven machine. An expert acquaintance with gasoline motors and magnetos is a prime necessity. In short, every bit of information on the subject of flying machines and their operation cannot fail to be useful in some degree. The dimensions of the various parts of the Santos Dumont monoplane are given on the original plans according to the metric system. In reducing these to long measure inches, all measurements have been given to the nearest eighth of an inch. In general, we may note some of the peculiarities of La Demoiselle. The spread of the plane is 18 feet from tip to tip, and it is 20 feet overall from bow to stern. In height, it is about 4 feet 2 inches when the propeller blades are in a horizontal position. The total weight of the machine is 265 pounds, of which the engine weighs about 66 pounds. The area of the plane is 115 square feet, so that the total weight supported by each square foot with Santos Dumont, weighing 110 pounds, on board, is a trifle over 3 pounds. The frame of the body of the monoplane is largely of bamboo, the three main poles being 2 inches in diameter at the front, and tapering to about 1 inch at the rear. They are jointed with brass sockets just back of the plane, for convenience of taking apart for transportation. Two of these poles extend from the axle of the wheels backward and slightly upward to the rudder post. The third extends from the middle of the plane between the wings, backward and downward, to the rudder post. 
In cross-section, the three form a triangle with the apex at the top. These bamboo poles are braced about every two feet with struts of steel tubing of oval section, and the panels so formed are tied by diagonals of piano wire fitted with turnbuckles to draw them taut. In the Santos Dumont machine, a two-cylinder, opposed Darach motor of 30 horsepower was used. It is of the water-cooled type, the cooling radiator being a gridiron of very thin 1 8 inch copper tubing, and hung up on the underside of the plane on either side of the engine. The cylinders have a bore of about 4 and 1 8 inches, and a stroke of about 4 and 3 quarters inches. The propeller is two-bladed, 6 and a half feet across, and is run at 1400 revolutions per minute, at which speed it exerts a pull of 242 pounds. Each wing of the main plane is built upon two transverse spars extending outward from the upper bamboo pole, starting at a slight angle upward and bending downward nearly to the horizontal as they approach the outer extremities. These spars are of ash, two inches wide, and tapering in thickness from one and one-eighth inches at the central bamboo to about seven-eighths of an inch at the tips of the wings. They are bent into shape by immersion in hot water, and straining them around blocks nailed to the floor of the workshop, in the form shown at QQ, page 177. The front spar is set about 9 inches back from the front edge of the plane, and the rear one about 12 inches forward of the back edge of the plane. Across these spars, and beneath them, running fore and aft, are bamboo rods about 3 quarters of an inch in diameter at the forward end, and tapering toward the rear. They are set 8.5 inches apart, center to center, except at the tips of the wings. The two outer panels are ten and a quarter inches from center to center of the rods to give greater elasticity in warping. These fore and aft rods are six feet five inches long, except directly back of the propeller, where they are five feet eight inch inches long. They are bound to the spars with brass wire number 25 at the intersections. They also are bent to a curved form, as shown in the plans, by the aid of the hot water bath. Diagonal guys of piano wire are used to truss the frame in two panels in each wing. Around the outer free ends of the rods runs a piano wire number 20, which is led into the tips of the rods in a slot 3-8 inch deep. To prevent the splitting of the bamboo, a turn or two of the brass wire may be made around the rod just back of the slot, but it is much better to provide thin brass caps for the ends of the rods and to cut the slots in the metal as well as in the rods. Instead of caps, ferrules will do. When the slots are cut, let the tongue formed in the cutting be bent down across the bamboo to form the floor to the slot, upon which the piano wire may rest. The difference in weight and cost is very little, and the damage that may result from a split rod may be serious. After the frame of the plane is completed, it is to be covered with cloth on both sides, so as entirely to enclose the frame, except only the tips of the rods, as shown in the plans. In the Santos Dumont monoplane, the cloth used is of closely woven silk, but a strong, unbleached muslin will do. The kind made especially for aeroplanes is best. Both upper and lower surfaces must be stretched taut, the edges front and back being turned over the piano wire, and the wire hemmed in. The upper and lower surfaces are then sewed together, through and through, as a seamstress would say, along both sides of each rod, so that the rods are practically in pockets. Nothing must be slighted if safety in flying is to be assured. The tail of the monoplane is a rigid combination of two planes intersecting each other at right angles along a central bamboo pole, which extends back three feet five and a half inches from the rudder post, to which it is attached by a double joint, permitting it to move upon either the vertical or the horizontal axis. Although this tail, or rudder, may seem at first glance somewhat complicated in the plans, it will not be found so if the frame of the upright or vertical plane be first constructed, and that of the level or horizontal plane afterward built fast to it at right angles. As with the main plane, the tail is to be covered on both sides with cloth, the vertical part first, the horizontal halves on either side so covered that the cloth of the latter may be sewed above and below the central pole. All of the ribs in the tail are to be stitched in with pockets, as directed for the rods of the main plane. The construction of the motor is possible to an expert machinist only, and the aeroplane builder will save time and money by buying his engine from a reliable maker. It is not necessary to send to France for a Darach motor. Any good gasoline engine of equal power, and about the same weight, will serve the purpose. The making of the propeller is practicable for a careful workman. The illustrations will give a better idea than words of how it should be done. 
It should be remembered, however, that the safety of the aviator depends as much upon the propeller as upon any other part of the machine. The splitting of the blades when in motion has been the cause of serious accidents. The utmost care, therefore, should be exercised in the selection of the wood, and in the gluing of the several sections into one solid mass, allowing the work to dry thoroughly under heavy pressure. The forming of the blades requires a good deal of skill, and some careful preliminary study. It is apparent that the speed of a point at the tip of a revolving blade is much greater than that of a point near the hub, for it traverses a larger circle in the same period of time. But if the propeller is to do effective work without unequal strain, the twist in the blade must be such that each point in the length of the blade is exerting an equal pull on the air. It is necessary, therefore, that the slower-moving part of the blade, near the hub or axis, shall cut deeper into the air than the more swiftly-moving tip of the blade. Consequently, the blade becomes continually flatter, approaching the plane in which it revolves, as we work from the hub outward toward the tip. This flattening is well shown in the nearly finished blade clamped to the bench at the right of the illustration, which shows a four-bladed propeller, instead of the two-bladed type needed for the monoplane. The propeller used for propulsion in air differs from the propeller wheel used for ships in water, in that the blades are curved laterally, the forward face of the blade being convex, and the rearward face concave. The object of this shaping is the same as for curving the surface of the plane, to secure smoother entry into the air forward, and a compression in the rear which adds to the holding power on the substance of the air. It is extremely difficult to describe this complex shape, and the amateur builder of a propeller will do well to inspect one made by a professional, or to buy it ready-made with his engine. The following quotation from Sir Hiram Maxim's account of his most effective propeller may aid the ambitious aeroplane builder. My large screws were made with a great degree of accuracy. They were perfectly smooth and even on both sides the blades being thin and held in position by a strip of rigid wood on the back of the blade. Like the small screws, they were made of the very best kind of seasoned American white pine, and when finished were varnished on both sides with hot glue. When this was thoroughly dry, they were sandpapered again and made perfectly smooth and even. The blades were then covered with strong Irish linen fabric of the smoothest and best make. Glue was used for attaching the fabric, and when dry another coat of glue was applied, the surface rubbed down again, and then painted with zinc white in the ordinary way and varnished. These screws worked exceedingly well. The covering of the blades with linen glued fast commends itself to the careful workman as affording precaution against the splintering of the blades when in rapid motion. Some propellers have their wooden blades encased with thin sheet aluminum to accomplish the same purpose, but for the amateur builder linen is far easier to apply. The wheels are of the bicycle type, with wire spokes, but with hubs six inches long. The axle is bent to incline upward at the ends, so that the wheels incline outward at the ground, the better to take the shock of a sideways thrust when landing. The usual metal or wood rims may be used, but special tires of exceptionally light construction, made for aeroplanes, should be purchased. The controlling wires or cords for moving the rudder or tail and for warping the tips of the wings are of flexible wire cable, such as is made for use as steering rope on small boats. The cable controlling the horizontal plane of the rudder tail is fastened to a lever at the right hand of the operator. The cable governing the vertical plane of the rudder tail is attached to a wheel at the left hand of the operator. The cables which warp the tips of the wings are fastened to a lever which projects upward just back of the operator's seat, and which is slipped into a long pocket sewed to the back of his coat, so that the swaying of his body, in response to the fling of the tipping machine, tends to restore it to an even keel. Springs are attached to all of these controlling wires, strong enough to bring them back to a normal position when the operator removes his hands from the steering apparatus. The brass sockets used in connecting the tubular struts to the main bamboos and the rudder post, and in fastening the axle of the wheels to the lower bamboos and elsewhere, should be thoroughly made and brazed by a good mechanic, for no one should risk the chance of a faulty joint at a critical spot, when an accident may mean the loss of life. For the rest, it has seemed better to put the details of construction on the plans themselves, where they will be available to the aeroplane builder without the trouble of continually consulting the text. Some of the work on an aeroplane will be found simple and easy, some of it difficult and requiring much patience, and some impracticable to anyone but a trained mechanic but in all of it the worker's motto should be fidelity in every detail 
End of chapter 9. Chapter 10 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 10. Flying Machines. Motors. The possibility of the existence of the flying machine as we have it today has been ascribed to the invention of the gasoline motor. While this is not to be denied, it is also true that the gasoline motors designed and built for automobiles and motor boats have had to be well-nigh revolutionized to make them suitable for use in the various forms of aircraft. And it is to be remembered, doubtless to their greater credit, that Henson, Hargrave, Langley, and Maxim had all succeeded in adapting steam to the problem of the flight of models, the two latter using gasoline to produce the steam. Perhaps the one predominant qualification demanded of the airplane motor is reliability. A motor car or motor boat can be stopped and engine troubles attended to with comparatively little inconvenience. The airplane simply cannot stop without peril. It is possible for a skilled pilot to reach the earth when his engine stops, if he is fortunately high enough to have space for the downward glide, which will gain for him the necessary headway for steering. At a lesser height, he is sure to crash to the earth. An understanding of the principles on which the gasoline motor works is essential to a fair estimate of the comparative advantages of the different types used to propel airplanes. In the first place, the radical difference between the gasoline motor and other engines is the method of using the fuel. It is not burned in ordinary fashion, but the gasoline is first vaporized and mixed with a certain proportion of air in a contrivance called a carburetor. This gaseous mixture is pumped into the cylinder of the motor by the action of the motor itself, compressed into about one-tenth of its normal volume, and then exploded by a strong electrical spark at just the right moment to have its force act most advantageously to drive the machine onward. It is apparent that there are several chances for failure in this series. The carburetor may not do its part accurately. The mixture of air and vapor may not be in such proportions that it will explode. In that case, the power from the stroke will be missing and the engine will falter and slow down. Or a leakage in the cylinder may prevent the proper compression of the mixture. The force from the explosion will be greatly reduced with a corresponding loss of power and speed or the electric spark may not be fat enough, that is, of sufficient volume and heat to fire the mixture, or it may not spark at just the right moment. If too soon, it will exert its force against the onward motion. If too late, it will not deliver the full power of the explosion at the time when its force is most useful. The necessity for absolute perfection in these operations is obvious. Other peculiarities of the gasoline motor affect considerably its use for airplanes. The continual and oft-repeated explosions of the gaseous mixture inside the cylinder generate great heat, and this not only interferes with its regularity of movement, but within a very brief time checks it altogether. To keep the cylinder cool enough to be serviceable, two methods are in use, the air cooling system and the water cooling system. In the first, flanges of very thin metal are cast on the outside of the cylinder wall. These flanges take up the intense heat and being spread out over a large surface in this way, the rushing of air through them as the machine flies, or sometimes blown through them with a rotary fan, cools them to some degree. With the water cooling system, the cylinder has an external jacket, the space between being filled with water, which is made to circulate constantly by a small pump. In its course, the water, which has just taken up the heat from the cylinder, travels through a radiator in which it is spread out very thin, and this radiator is so placed in the machine that it receives the full draft from the air rushing through the machine as it flies. The amount of water required for cooling a motor is about one and a fifth pounds per horsepower. With an eight-cylinder, 50-horsepower motor, this water would add the very considerable item of 60 pounds to the weight the machine has to carry. As noted in a previous chapter, the McCurdy biplane has its radiator formed into a sustaining plane and supports its own weight when traveling in the air. It is an unsettled point with manufacturers whether the greater efficiency, generally acknowledged, 
of the water-cooled engine more than compensates for the extra weight of the water. Another feature peculiar to the gasoline motor is the necessity for such continual oiling that it is styled lubrication, and various devices have been invented to do the work automatically, without attention from the pilot further than the watching of his oil gauge to see that a full flow of oil is being pumped through the oiling system. The electric current which produces the spark inside the cylinder is supplied by a magneto, a machine formed of permanent magnets of horseshoe form, between the poles of which a magnetized armature is made to revolve rapidly by the machinery which turns the propeller. This magneto is often connected with a small storage battery, or accumulator, which stores up a certain amount of current for use when starting, or in case the magneto gives out. The great rivalry of the builders of motors has been in cutting down the weight per horsepower to the lowest possible figure. It goes without saying that useless weight is a disadvantage in an airplane, but it has not been proven that the very lightest engines have made a better showing than those of sturdier build. One of the items in the weight of an engine has been the flywheel found necessary on all motors of four cylinders or less to give steadiness to the running. With a larger number of cylinders and a consequently larger number of impulses in the circuit of the propeller, the vibration is so reduced that the flywheel has been dispensed with. There are several distinct types of aircraft engines based on the arrangement of the cylinders. The tandem type has the cylinders standing upright in a row, one behind another. There may be as many as eight in a row. The Curtis and Wright engines are examples. Another type is the opposed arrangement, the cylinders being placed in a horizontal position and in two sets, one working opposite the other. An example of this type is seen in the Derrick motor used in the Santos Dumont monoplane. Another type is the V arrangement, the cylinders are alternately leaning to right and to left, as seen in the Fiat engine. Still another type is the radiant, in which the cylinders are all above the horizontal and disposed like rays from the rising sun. The three-cylinder Anzani engine and the five- and seven-cylinder REP engines are examples. The star type is exemplified in the five- and seven-cylinder engines in which the cylinders radiate at equal angles all around the circle. The double opposed, or cross-shaped type, is shown in the Gobron engine. In all these types, the cylinders are stationary and turn the propeller shaft either by cranks or by gearing. An entirely distinct type of engine, and one which has been devised solely for the airplane, is the rotative, often miscalled the rotary, which is totally different. The rotative type may be illustrated by the gnome motor. In this engine, the seven cylinders turn around the shaft, which is stationary. The propeller is fastened to the cylinders and revolves with them. This ingenious effect is produced by an offset of the crankshaft of half the stroke of the pistons, whose rods are all connected with the crankshaft. The entire system revolves around the main shaft as a center, the crankshaft being also stationary. Strictly speaking, the propeller is not a part of the motor of the flying machine, but it is so intimately connected with it in the utilization of the power created by the motor that it will be treated of briefly in this chapter. The form of the air propeller has passed through a long and varied development, starting with that of the marine propeller, which was found to be very inefficient in so loose a medium as air. On account of this lack of density in the air, it was found necessary to act on large masses of it at practically the same time to gain the thrust needed to propel the airplane swiftly, and this led to increasing the diameter of the propeller to secure action on a proportionally larger area of air. The principle involved is simply the geometric rule that the area of circles are to each other as the squares of their radii. Thus, the surface of air acted on by two propellers, one of six feet diameter and the other of eight feet diameter, would be in the proportion of nine to sixteen. And as the central part of a propeller has practically no thrust effect, the efficiency of the eight-foot propeller is nearly twice that of the six-foot propeller, other factors being equal but these other factors may be made to vary widely. For instance, the number of revolutions may be increased for the smaller propeller, thus engaging more air than the larger one at a lower speed. And, in practice, it is possible to run a small propeller at a speed that would not be safe for a large one. Another factor is the pitch of the propeller, which may be described as the distance the hub of the propeller would advance in one complete revolution if the blades moved in an unyielding medium as a section of the thread of an ordinary bolt moves in its nut. 
in the yielding mass of the air the propeller advances only a part of its pitch in some cases not more than half the difference between the theoretical advance and the actual advance is called the slip in practical work the number of blades which have been found to be most effective is two more blades than two seems to so disturb the air that there is no hold for the propeller in the case of slowly revolving propellers as in most airship mechanisms four-bladed propellers are used with good effect but where the diameter of the propeller is about eight feet and the number of revolutions about twelve hundred per minute the two-bladed type is used almost exclusively the many differing forms of the blades of the propeller is evidence that the manufacturers have not decided upon any definite shape as being the best some have straight edges nearly or quite parallel others have the entering edge straight and the rear edge curved in others the entering edge is curved and the rear edge straight or both edges may be curved the majority of the wooden propellers are of the third mentioned type and the curve is fashioned so that at each section of its length the blade presents the same area of surface in the same time hence the outer tip traveling the fastest is narrower than the middle of the blade and it is also much thinner to lessen the centrifugal force acted upon it at great speeds near the hub however where the travel is slowest the constructional problem demands that the blade contract in width and be made stout in fact it becomes almost round in section many propellers are made of metal with tubular shanks and blades of sheet metal the latter either solid sheets or formed with a double surface and hollow inside still others have a frame of metal with blades of fabric put on loosely so that it may adapt itself to the pressure of the air in revolving that great strength is requisite becomes plain when it is considered that the speed of the tip of the propeller blade often reaches seven miles a minute and at this velocity the centrifugal force excited tending to tear the blades to splinters is prodigious just as the curved surface of the planes of an airplane is more effective than a flat surface in compressing the air beneath them and thus securing a firmer medium in which to glide so the propeller blades are curved laterally across their width to compress the air behind them and thus secure a better hold the advancing side of a blade is formed with a still greater curve to gain the advantage due to the unexplained lift of the paradox airplane where the propeller is built of wood it is made of several layers usually of different kinds of wood with the grain running in slightly different directions and all carefully glued together into a solid block ash spruce and mahogany in alternating layers are a favorite combination in some instances the wooden propeller is sheathed in sheet aluminum in others it is well coated with glue which is sandpapered down very smooth then varnished and then polished to the highest luster to reduce the effect of the viscosity of the air to the minimum in order to get the best results the propeller and the motor must be suited to each other some motors which race with a propeller which is slightly too small work admirably with one a little heavier or with a longer diameter the question as to whether one propeller or two is the better practice has not been decided the majority of airplanes have but one the wright and cody machines have two the certainty of serious consequences to a machine having two should one of them be disabled or even broken so as to reduce the area seems to favor the use of but one end of section ten chapter eleven of how it flies or conquest of the air this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org how it flies or conquest of the air by richard ferris chapter eleven model flying machines it is related of benjamin franklin that when he went out with his famous kite with the wire string trying to le collect electricity from the thundercloud he took a boy along to forestall the ridicule that he knew would be meted out to him if he openly flew the kite himself other scientific experimenters notably those working upon the problem of human flight in our own time have encountered a similar condition of the public mind and have chosen to conduct their trials in secret rather than to contend with the derision, criticism, and loss of reputation which a skeptical world would have been quick to heap upon them. 
but such a complete revolution of thought has been experienced in these latter days that groups of notable scientific men gravely flying kites or experimenting with carefully made models of flying machines arouse only the deepest interest and their smallest discoveries are eagerly seized upon by the daily press as news of the first importance so much remains to be learned in the field of aeronautics that no builder and flyer of the little model aeroplanes can fail to gain valuable information if that is his intention on the other hand if it be the sport of racing these model aeroplanes which appeals to him the instruction given in the pages following will be equally useful the earnest student of aviation is reminded that the progressive work in this new art of flying is not being done altogether nor even in large part by the daring operators who with superb courage are performing such remarkable feats with the flying machines of the present moment not one of them would claim that his machine is all that could be desired on the contrary these intrepid men more than any others are fully aware of the many and serious defects of the apparatus they use for lack of better the scientific student in his workshop patiently experimenting with his models and working to prove or disprove untested theories is doubtless doing an invaluable part in bringing about the sort of flying which will be more truly profitable to humanity in general though less spectacular one of the greatest needs of the present machines is an automatic balancer which shall supersede the concentrated attention which the operator is now compelled to exercise in order to keep his machine right side up the discovery of the principle upon which such a balancer must be built is undoubtedly within the reach of the builder and flyer of models it has been asserted by an eminent scientific experimenter in things aeronautic that we cannot hope to make a sensitive apparatus quick enough to take advantage of the rising currents of the air etc with due respect to the publicly expressed opinion of this investigator it is well to reassure ourselves against so pessimistic an outlook by remembering that the construction of just such supersensitive apparatus is a task to which man has frequently applied his intellectual powers with signal success witness the photomicroscope which records faithfully an enlarged view of objects too minute to be even visible to the human eye the aneroid barometer so sensitive that will it will indicate the difference in level between the table and the floor the thermostat which regulates the temperature of the water flowing in the domestic heating system with a delicacy impossible to the most highly constituted human organism the seismograph detecting recording and almost locating earth tremors originating thousands of miles away the automatic fire sprinkler the safety valve the recording thermometer and other meteorological instruments and last if not of least importance the common alarm clock and these are but a few of the contrivances with which man does by blind mechanism that which is impossible to his sentient determination even if the nervous system could be schooled into endurance of the wear and tear of consciously balancing an aeroplane for many hours it is still imperative that the task be not left to the exertion of human wits but controlled by self-acting devices responding instantly to unforeseen conditions as they occur some of the problems of which the model builder may find the solution are whether large screws revolving slowly or small screws revolving rapidly are the more effective how many blades a propeller should have and their most effective shape what is the perfect material for the planes maxim found that with a smooth wooden plane he could lift two and a half times the weight that could be lifted with the best made fabric covered plane whether the center of gravity of the aeroplane should be above or below the center of lift or should coincide with it new formulas for the correct expression of the lift in terms of velocity and angle of inclination the former formulas having been proved erroneous by actual experience how to take the best advantage of the tangential force announced by lilienthal and reasserted by hargrave and many others and there is always the paradox airplane to be explained and when explained it will be no longer a paradox but will doubtless open the way to the most surprising advance in the art of flying it is not assumed that every reader of this chapter will become a studious experimenter but it is unquestionably true that every model builder in his effort to produce winning machines will be more than likely to discover some fact of value in the progress making toward the ultimate establishment of the commercial navigation of the air the tools and materials requisite for the building of model airplanes are few and inexpensive for the tools a small hammer a small iron block plane a fine cut half round file a pair of round nose pliers three twist drills as used for drilling metals the largest one sixteenth inch diameter and two smaller sizes with an adjustable brad awl handle to hold them a sharp pocket knife and if practicable a small hand vise 
the vice may be dispensed with, and common brad awls may take the place of the drills, if necessary. For the first described model, the simplest, the following materials are needed. Some thin white wood, 1 16th inch thick, as prepared for fret sawing. Some spruce sticks, 1 quarter inch square, skyrocket sticks are good. A sheet of heavy glazed paper. A bottle of liquid glue. Some of the smallest, in diameter, brass screws, 1 quarter to 1 half inch long. Some brass wire, 1 20th inch in diameter. 100 inches of square rubber elastic cord such as is used on return balls, but 1 16th inch square, and a few strips of draughtsman's tracing cloth. As the propeller is the most difficult part to make, it is best to begin with it. The flat blank is cut out of the white wood and subjected to the action of steam issuing from the spout of an actively boiling tea kettle. The steam must be hot. Mere vapor will not do the work. When the strip has become pliable, the shaping is done by slowly bending and twisting at the same time, Perhaps coaxing would be the better word, for it must be done gently and with patience, and the steam must be playing on the wood all the time, first on one side of the strip, then on the other, at the point where the fibers are being bent. The utmost care should be taken to have the two blades bent exactly alike, although, of course, with a contrary twist, the one to the right and the other to the left, on each side of the center. A lead pencil line across each blade at exactly the same distance from the center will serve to fix accurately the center of the bend. If two blocks are made with slots cut at the angle of one inch rise to two and a quarter inches base, and nailed to the top of the workbench just far enough apart to allow the tips of the screw to be slid into the slots, the drying in perfect shape will be facilitated. The center may be held to a true upright by two other blocks, one on each side of the center. Some strips of white wood may be so rigid that the steam will not make them sufficiently supple. In this case it may be necessary to dip them bodily into the boiling water, or even to leave them immersed for a few minutes, afterward bending them in the hot steam. But a wetted stick requires longer to dry and set in the screw shape. When the propeller is thoroughly dry and set in proper form, it should be worked into the finished shape with the half-round file, according to the several sections shown beside the elevation for each part of the blade. The two strengthening pieces are then to be glued on at the center of the screw, and when thoroughly dry, worked down smoothly to shape. When all is dry and hard, it should be smoothed with the finest emery cloth, and given a coat of shellac varnish, which, in turn, may be rubbed to a polish with rotten stone and oil. It may be remarked, in passing, that this is a crude method of making a propeller, and the result cannot be very good. It is given here because it is the easiest way, and the propeller will work. A much better way is described further on, and the better the propeller, the better any model will fly. But for a novice, no time will be lost in making this one, for the experience gained will enable the model builder to do better work with a second one than he could do without it. For the aeroplane body, we get out a straight spar of spruce, one quarter inch square, and fifteen and a half inches long. At the front end of this, on the upper side, is to be glued a small triangular piece of wood to serve as a support for the forward or steering plane, tilting it up at the front edge at the angle represented by a rise of 1 in 8. This block should be shaped on its upper side to fit the curve of the underside of the steering plane, which will be screwed to it. The steering plane is cut according to plan, out of 1 16th inch white wood, planed down gradually to be at the ends about half that thickness. This plane is to be steamed and bent to a curve, fore and aft, as shown in the sectional view. The steam should play on the convex side of the bend while it is being shaped. To hold it in proper form until it is set, blocks with curved slots may be used, or it may be bound with thread to a molding block of equal length formed to the proper curve. When thoroughly dry, it is to be smoothed with the emery cloth, and a strip of tracing cloth, glossy face out, is to be glued across each end to prevent breaking in case of a fall. It is then to be varnished with shellac and polished as directed for the propeller. Indeed, it should be said once for all that every part of the model should be as glossy as it is possible to make it without adding to the weight, and that all entering edges, those which push into and divide the air when in flight, should be as sharp as is practicable with the material used. The steering plane is to be fastened in place by a single screw long enough to pierce the plane and the supporting block and enter the spar. The hole for this screw, as for all screws used, should be drilled carefully, to avoid the least splitting of the wood, 
and just large enough to have the screw bite without forcing its way in. This screw which holds the plane is to be screwed home, but not too tight, so that in case the flying model should strike upon it in falling, the slender plane will swivel and not break. It will be noticed that while this screw passes through the center of the plane sideways, it is nearer to the forward edge than to the rear edge. If the work has been accurate, the plane will balance if the spar is supported, upon the finger, perhaps, as that is sensitive to any tendency to tipping. If either wing is too heavy, restore the balance by filing a little from the tip of that wing. The main planes are next to be made. The lower deck of the biplane is of the 1 16th inch whitewood, and the upper one is of the glazed paper upon a skeleton framework of wood. The upright walls are of paper. The wooden deck is to be bent into the proper curve with the aid of steam, and when dry and set in form is to be finished and polished. The frame for the upper deck is made of the thin white wood, and is held to its position by two diagonal struts of white wood bent at the ends with steam, and two straight upright struts or posts. It is better to bend all cross pieces into the curve of the plane with steam, but they may be worked into the curve on the top side with plane and file, and left flat on the lower side. The drawings show full details of the construction, drawn accurately to scale. It is best to glue all joints, and in addition to insert tiny screws where shown in the plans at the time of gluing. When all the wooden parts are in place, the entire outline of the upper plane and the upright walls is to be formed of silk thread carried from point to point, and tied upon very small pins, such as are used in rolls of ribbon at the stores, inserted in the wood. This, the glazed paper is put on double, glossy side out. Cut the pieces twice as large, and a trifle more, than is needed, and fold so that the smooth crease comes to the front and the cut edges come together at the rear. The two inner walls should be put in place first, so as to enclose the thread front and back, and the post between the two leaves of the folded paper. Cutting the paper half an inch too long will give one-fourth of an inch to turn flat top and bottom to fasten to the upper and lower decks, respectively. The two outer walls and the upper deck may be cut all in one piece, the under leaf being slit to pass on either side of the inner walls. A bit of glue here and there will steady the parts to their places. The cut edges at the rear of the deck and walls should be caught together with a thin film of glue so as to enclose the rear threads. When the biplane is completed, it is to be fastened securely to the spar in such a position that it is accurately balanced from side to side. The spar may be laid on a table and the biplane placed across it in its approximate position. Then move the plane to one side until it tips down, and mark the spot on the rear edge of the plane. Repeat this operation toward the other side, and the center between the two marks should be accurately fastened over the center line of the spar. Even with the greatest care there may still be failure to balance exactly, but a little work with a file on the heavy side, or a bit of chewing gum stuck on the lighter side, will remedy the matter. The body of the aeroplane being now built, it is in order to fit it with propelling mechanism. The motive power to whirl the propeller we have already prepared is to be the torsion, or twisting strain, in this case the force of untwisting, of India rubber. When several strands of pure rubber cord are twisted up tight, their elasticity tends to untwist them with considerable force. The attachment for the rubber strands at the front end of the spar is a sort of bracket made of the brass wire. The ends of the wire are turned up just a little, and they are set into little holes in the underside of the spar. Where the wire turns downward to form the hook, it is bound tightly to the spar with silk thread. The hook-shaped tip is formed of the loop of the wire doubled upon itself. The rear attachment of the rubber strands is a loop upon the propeller shaft itself. As shown in the drawings, this shaft is but a piece of the brass wire. On one end, the rear, an open loop is formed, and into this is slipped the center of the propeller. The short end of the loop is then twisted around the longer shank, very carefully lest the wire cut into and destroy the propeller. Two turns of the wire is enough, and then the tip of the twisted end should be worked down flat with the file to serve as a bearing for the propeller against the thrust block. This ladder is made of a piece of sheet brass, a bit of printer's brass rule is just the thing, about one-fortieth of an inch thick. It should be a quarter of an inch wide except at the forward end, where it is to be filed to a long point and bent up a trifle to enter the wood of the spar. The rear end is bent down, not too sharply, lest it break, to form the bearing for the propeller, a hole being drilled through it for the propeller shaft, 
just large enough for the shaft to turn freely in it. Another smaller hole is to be drilled for a little screw to enter the rear end of the spar. Next pass the straight end of the propeller shaft through the hole drilled for it, and with the pliers form a round hook for the rear attachment of the rubber strands. Screw the brass bearing into place, and for additional strength, wind a binding of silk thread around it and the spar. Tie the ends of the rubber cord together, divide it into ten even strands, and pass the loops over the two hooks, and the machine is ready for flight. To wind up the rubber, it will be necessary to turn the propeller in the opposite direction to which it will move when the model is flying. About a hundred turns will be required. After it is wound, hold the machine by the rear end of the spar, letting the propeller press against the hand so it cannot unwind. Raise it slightly above the head, holding the spar level, or inclined upward a little, as experience may dictate, and launch the model by a gentle throw forward. If the work has been well done, it may fly from 150 to 200 feet. Many experiments may be made with this machine. If it flies too high, weight the front end of the spar. If too low, gliding downward from the start, weight the rear end. A bit of chewing gum may be enough to cause it to ride level and make a longer and prettier flight. A very graceful model is that of the monoplane type illustrated in the accompanying reproductions from photographs. The front view shows the little machine just ready to take flight from a table. The view from the rear is a snapshot taken while it was actually flying. This successful model was made by Harold S. Lynn of Stamford, Connecticut. Before discussing the details of construction, let us notice some peculiar features shown by the photographs. The forward plane is arched, that is, the tips of the plane bend slightly downward from the center. On the contrary, the two wings of the rear plane bend slightly upward from the center, making a dihedral angle, as it is called, that is, an angle between two surfaces, as distinguished from an angle between two lines. The toy wheels, Mr. Lynn says, are put on principally for looks, but they are also useful in permitting a start to be made from a table or even from the floor, instead of the usual way of holding the model in the hands and giving it a slight throw to get it started. However, the wheels add to the weight, and the model will not fly quite so far with them as without. The wood from which this model was made was taken from a bamboo fish pole, such as may be bought anywhere for a dime. The pole was split up, and the suitable pieces whittled and planed down to the proper sizes, as given in the plans. In putting the framework of the planes together, it is well to notch very slightly each rib and spar where they cross. Touch the joint with a bit of liquid glue, and wind quickly with a few turns of sewing silk, and tie tightly. This must be done with delicacy, or the frames will be out of true. If the work is done rapidly, the glue will not set until all the ties on the plane are finished. Another way is to touch the joinings with a drop of glue, place the ribs in position on the spars, and lay a board carefully on the work, leaving it there until all is dry, when the tying can be done. In either case, the joinings should be touched again with the liquid glue, and allowed to dry hard. The best material for covering these frames is the thinnest of china silk. If this is too expensive, use the thinnest cambric. But the model will not fly so far with the cambric covering. The material is cut one-fourth of an inch too large on every side, and folded over, and the fold glued down. Care should be taken that the frame is square and true before the covering is glued on. The motive power is produced by twisting up a rubber tubing. Five and three-quarter feet of pure rubber tubing are required. It is tied together with silk so as to form a continuous ring. This is looped over two screw hooks of brass, one in the rear block and the other constituting the shaft. This looped tubing is twisted by turning the propeller backward about 200 turns. As it untwists, it turns the propeller, which, in this model, is a traction screw, and pulls the machine after it as it advances through the air. The propeller in this instance is formed from a piece of very thin tin, such as is used for the tops of cans containing condensed milk. Reference to the many illustrations throughout this book showing propellers of flying machines will give one a very good idea of the proper way to bend the blades. The mounting with the glass bead and the two leather washers is shown in detail in the plans. The wheels are taken from a toy wagon, and a pair of tin ears will serve as bearings for the axle. The sport of flying model airplanes has led to the formation of many clubs in this country as well as in Europe. Some of the mechanisms that have been devised, and some of the contrivances to make the models fly better and further, are illustrated in the drawings. 
Records have been made which seem marvelous when it is considered that 200 feet is a very good flight for a model propelled by rubber. For instance, at the contest of the Birmingham Aero Club, England, in September, one of the contestants won the prize with a flight of 447 feet, lasting 48 seconds. The next best records for duration of flight were 39 seconds and 38 seconds. A model airplane which is guaranteed to fly 1,000 feet, according to the advertisement in an English magazine, is offered for sale at $15. The American record for length of flight is held by Mr. Frank Schober of New York, with a distance of 215 feet 6 inches. His model was of the Langley type of tandem monoplane and very highly finished. The problem is largely one of adequate power without serious increase of weight. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 12. The Glider. It is a matter of record that the Wright brothers spent the better part of three years among the sand dunes of the North Carolina sea coast, practicing with gliders. In this way they acquired that confidence while in the air which comes from intimate acquaintance with its peculiarities, and which cannot be gained in any other way. It is true that the Wrights were then developing not only themselves, but also their gliders but the latter work was done once for all. To develop aviators, however, means the repeating of the same process for each individual, just as each for himself must be taught to read. And the glider is the first reader in aeronautics. The long trail of wrecks of costly aeroplanes marking the progress in the art of flying marks also the lack of preparatory training, which their owners either thought unnecessary or hoped to escape by some royal road less wearisome than persistent personal practice. But they all paid dearly to discover that there is no royal road. Practice, more practice, and still more practice. That is the secret of successful aeroplane flight. For this purpose, the glider is much superior to the power-driven aeroplane. There are no controls to learn, no mechanism to manipulate, one simply launches into the air and concentrates his efforts upon balancing himself and the apparatus, not as two distinct bodies, however, but as a united whole. When practice has made perfect the ability to balance the glider instinctively, nine-tenths of the art of flying an aeroplane has been achieved. Not only this, but a new sport has been laid under contribution, one beside which, coasting upon a snow-clad hillside, is a crude form of enjoyment. Fortunately for the multitude, a glider is easily made, and its cost is even less than that of a bicycle. A modest degree of skill, with a few carpenter's tools, and a little gumption, about odd jobs in general, is all that is required of the glider builder. The frame of the glider is of wood, and spruce is recommended, as it is stronger and tougher for its weight than other woods. It should be of straight grain and free from knots, and as there is considerable difference in the weight of spruce from other trees, it is well to go over the pile in the lumber yard and pick out the lightest boards. Have them planed down smooth on both sides, and to the required thickness at the mill. It will save much toilsome handwork. The separate parts may also be sawed out at the mill, if one desires to avoid this labour. The lumber needed is as follows. Four spars, twenty feet long, one and a quarter inches wide, three quarters inches thick. Twelve struts, three feet long, one and a quarter inches wide, three quarters of an inch thick. Two rudder bars, eight feet long, three quarters of an inch wide, half an inch thick. Twelve posts, four feet long, one and a half inch wide, half an inch thick. 41 ribs, 4 feet long, half an inch wide, half an inch thick. 2 armrests, 
four feet long, two inches wide, one inch thick. For rudder frame, twenty-four running feet, one inch wide, one inch thick. If it be impossible to find clear spruce lumber twenty feet in length, the spars may be built up by splicing two ten-foot sticks together. For this purpose, the splicing stick should be as heavy as the single spar, one and a quarter inches wide and three quarter inches thick, and at least four feet long, to be bolted fast to the spar with six one eighth inch round head carriage bolts, with washers of large bearing surface, that is, a small hole to fit the bolt, and a large outer diameter, at both ends of the bolt, to prevent crushing the wood. A layer of liquid glue brushed between will help to make the joint firmer. Wherever a bolt is put in, a hole should be bored for it with a bit of such size as the bolt will fit snug in the hole without straining the grain of the wood. The corners of the finished spar are to be rounded off on a large curvature. The ends of the struts are to be cut down on a slight slant of about one sixteenth of an inch in the one and a quarter inches that it laps under the spar, with the idea of tipping the top of the spar forward so that the ribs will spring naturally from it into the proper curve. The ribs should be bent by steaming and allowed to dry and set in a form, or between blocks nailed upon the floor to a line of the correct curve. They are then nailed to the frames, the front end first, 21 to the frame of the upper plane and 20 to that of the lower plane, omitting one at the centre where the arm pieces will be placed. Some builders tack the ribs lightly into place with small brads and screw clamps formed from sheet brass or aluminum over them. Others use copper nails and clinch them over washers on the underside. Both methods are shown in the plans, but the clamps are recommended as giving greater stiffness an essential feature. At the front edge of the frames, the ribs are fastened flush, and being four feet long and the frame but three feet wide, they project over the rear about one foot. The arm pieces are bolted to the spars of the lower frame, six and a half inches on each side of the centre, so as to allow a free space of thirteen inches between them. This opening may be made wider to accommodate a stouter person. The posts are then put into place and bolted to the struts and the spars as shown with one-eighth inch bolts. The entire structure is then to be braced diagonally with number 16 piano wire. The greatest care must be taken to have these diagonals pull just taut so that they shall not warp the lines of the frames out of true. A crooked frame will not fly straight and is a source of danger when making a landing. The frames are now to be covered. There is a special balloon cloth made which is best for the purpose, but if that cannot be procured, strong cambric muslin will answer. Thirty yards of goods one yard wide will be required for the planes and the rudder. From the piece cut off seven lengths for each plane, four feet six inches long. These are to be sewed together, selvage to selvage, so as to make a sheet about 19 feet 6 inches long and 4 feet 6 inches wide. As this is to be tacked to the frame, the edges must be double-hemmed to make them strong enough to resist tearing out at the tacks. Half an inch is first folded down all around. The fold is then turned back on the goods, 2.5 inches, and sewed. This hem is then folded back one inch upon itself and again stitched. Strips three inches wide and a little over four feet long are folded three double into a width of one inch and sewed along both edges to the large sheet exactly over where the ribs come. These are to strengthen the fabric where the ribs press against it. Sixteen ounce tacks are used being driven through a felt washer the size of a gun rod at intervals of four inches. If felt is not readily obtainable, common felt gun wads will do. The tacking is best begun at the middle of the frame, having folded the cloth there to get the center. Then stretch smoothly out to the four corners and tack at each. It may then be necessary to loosen the two center tacks and place them over again to get rid of wrinkles. 
the next tacks to drive are the ends of the struts then halfway between and so on until all are in and the sheet is taut and smooth for a finer finish brass round head upholsterer's nails may be used the rudder so called is rather a tail for it is not movable and does not steer the glider it does steady the machine however and is very important in preserving the equilibrium when in flight it is formed of two small planes intersecting each other at right angles and covered on both sides with the cloth the sections covering the vertical part being cut along the centre and hemmed on to the upper and lower faces of the horizontal part the frame for the vertical part is fastened to the two rudder bars which stretch out toward the rear one from the upper plane and the other from the lower the whole construction is steadied by guys of the piano wire to make a glide the machine is taken to an elevated point on a slope not far up to begin with lift the glider get in between the arm rests and raise the apparatus until the rests are snug under the arms run swiftly for a few yards and leap into the air holding the front of the planes slightly elevated if the weight of the body is in the right position and the speed sufficient the glider will take the air and sail with you down the slope it may be necessary at first to have the help of two assistants one at each end to run with the glider for a good start the position of the body on the armrest can best be learned by a few experiments no two gliders are quite alike in this respect and no rule can be given as to the requisite speed it must be between fifteen and twenty miles an hour and as this speed is impossible to a man running it is gained by gliding against the wind and thus adding the speed of the wind to the speed of the runner the wrights selected the sand dunes of the north carolina coast for their glider experiments because of the steady winds that blow in from the ocean across the land these winds gave them the necessary speed of air upon which to sail their gliders the first flights attempted should be short and as experience is gained longer ones may be essayed balancing the glider from side to side is accomplished by swaying the lower part of the body like a pendulum the weight to go toward the side which has risen swinging the body forward on the armrests will cause the machine to dip the planes and glide more swiftly down the incline holding the weight of the body back in the armrests will cause the machine to fly on a higher path and at a lower speed this is objectionable because the glider is more manageable at a higher speed and therefore safer the tendency at first is to place the weight too far back with a consequent loss of velocity and with that a proportionate loss of control the proper position of the body is slightly forward of the mechanical structure of the machine the landing is accomplished by shoving the body backward thus tilting up the front of the plane this checks the speed and when the feet touch the ground a little run while holding back will bring the glide to an end landing should be practised often with the brief glides until skill is gained for it is the most difficult operation in gliding after one becomes expert longer flights may be secured by going for higher points for a start from an elevation of three hundred feet a glide of twelve hundred feet is possible while it is necessary to make glides against the wind it is not wise to attempt flights when the wind blows harder than ten miles an hour while the flight may be successful the landing may be disastrous the accomplished glider operator is in line for the aeroplane and it is safe to say that he will not be long without one the skilful and practised operator of a glider makes the very best aeroplane pilot this chapter would not be complete without an adequate reference to the gliders devised by professor montgomery of santa clara california these machines were sent up with ordinary hot air balloons to various heights reaching four thousand feet in some instances when they were cut loose and allowed to descend in a long glide guided by their pilots the time of the descent from the highest altitude was twenty minutes during which the glider travelled about eight miles the landing was made accurately upon a designated spot and so gently that there was no perceptible jar two of the pilots turned completely over sideways the machines righting itself after the somersault 
and continuing its regular course professor montgomery has made the assertion that he can fasten a bag of sand weighing one hundred and fifty pounds in the driver's seat of his glider and send it up tied upside down under a balloon and that after being cut loose the machine will right itself and come safely to the ground without any steering lilienthal in germany pilcher in england and chanute in the united states are names eminent in connection with the experiments with gliders which have been productive of discoveries of the greatest importance to the progress of aviation the illustration of the chanute glider shows its peculiarities plainly enough to enable any one to comprehend them the establishment of glider clubs in several parts of the country has created a demand for ready-made machines so that an enthusiast who does not wish to build his own machine may purchase it ready-made End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of how it flies or conquest of the air this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org how it flies or conquest of the air by richard ferris chapter thirteen balloons the balloon though the earliest and crudest means of getting up in the air has not become obsolete it has been in existence practically in its present general form for upwards of five hundred years appliances have been added from time to time but the big gas envelope enclosing a volume of some gas lighter than an equal volume of air and the basket or car suspended below it remain as the typical form of aerial vehicle which has not changed since it was first devised in times so remote as to lie outside the boundaries of recorded history the common shape of the gas bag of a balloon is that of the sphere or sometimes of an inverted pair it is allowed to rise and float away in the air as the prevailing wind may carry it attempts have been made to steer it in a desired direction but they did not accomplish much until the gas bag was made long horizontally in proportion to its height and width with a drag rope trailing behind on the ground from the rear end of the gas bag and sails on the forward end it was possible to guide the elongated balloon to some extent in a determined direction in explaining why a balloon rises in the air it is customary to quote the principle of archimedes discovered and formulated by that famous philosopher centuries before the christian era briefly stated it is this every body immersed in a fluid is acted upon by a force pressing upward which is equal to the weight of the amount of the fluid displaced by the immersed body it remained for sir isaac newton to explain the principle of archimedes by the discovery of the law of gravitation and to show that the reason why the immersed body is apparently pushed upward is that the displaced fluid is attracted downward in the case of a submerged bag of a gas lighter than air the amount of force acting on the surrounding air is greater than that acting on the gas and the latter is simply crowded out of the way by the descending air and forced up to a higher level where its lighter bulk is balanced by the gravity acting upon it the fluid in which the balloon is immersed is the air the force with which the air crowds down around and under the balloon is its weight weight being the measure of the attraction which gravity exerts upon any substance the weight of air at a temperature of thirty two degrees fahrenheit at the normal barometer pressure at the sea level twenty nine point nine two inches of mercury is point oh eight oh seven pounds per cubic foot the gas used to fill a balloon must therefore weigh less than this bulk for bulk in order to be crowded upward by the heavier air and thus exert its lifting power as it is commonly called in practice two gases have been used for inflating balloons hydrogen and illuminating gas made ordinarily from coal and called coal gas hydrogen is the lightest substance known that is it is attracted less by gravity than any other known substance in proportion to its bulk a cubic foot of hydrogen weighs but point zero zero five six pounds and it will therefore be pushed upward in air by the difference in weight or point zero seven five one pounds per cubic foot a cubic foot of coal gas weighs about point zero four zero zero pounds and is crowded upward in air with a force of point zero four zero seven pounds it is readily seen that a very large bulk of hydrogen must be used if any considerable weight is to be lifted for to the weight of the gas must be added the weight of the containing bag the car and the network supporting it the ballast 
instruments, and passengers, and there must still be enough more to afford elevating power sufficient to raise the entire load to the desired level. Let us assume that we have a balloon with a volume of 20,000 cubic feet, which weighs with its appurtenances 500 pounds. The hydrogen it would contain would weigh about 112 pounds, and the weight of the air it would displace would be about 1,620 pounds. The total available lifting power would be about 1,000 pounds. If a long-distance journey is to be undertaken at a comparatively low level, this will be sufficient to carry the necessary ballast and a few passengers. If, however, it is intended to rise to a great height, the problem is different. The weight of the air, and consequently its lifting pressure, decreases as we go upwards. If the balloon has not been entirely filled, the gas will expand as the pressure is reduced to the higher altitude. This has the effect of carrying the balloon higher. Heating of the contained gas by the sun will also cause a rise. On the other hand, the diffusion of the gas through the envelope into the air and the penetration of air into the gas bag will produce a mixture heavier than hydrogen and will cause the balloon to descend. The extreme cold of the upper air has the same effect, as it tends to condense to a smaller bulk the gas in the balloon. To check a descent, the load carried by the gas must be lightened by throwing out some of the ballast, which is carried simply for this purpose. Finally, a level is reached where equilibrium is established, and above which it is impossible to rise. The earliest recorded ascent of a balloon is credited to the Chinese, on the occasion of the coronation of the Emperor Fokien at Pekin in the year 1306. If this may be called historical, it gives evidence also that it speedily became a lost art. The next really historic record belongs in the latter part of the 17th century, where Cyrano de Bergerac attempted to fly with the aid of bags of air attached to his person, expecting them to be so expanded by the heat of the sun as to rise with sufficient force to lift him. He did not succeed, but his idea is plainly the forerunner of the hot air balloon. In the same century, Francisco de Lana, who was clearly a man of much intelligence and keen reasoning ability, having determined by experiment that the atmosphere had weight, decided that he would be able to rise into the air in a ship lifted by four metal spheres twenty feet in diameter from which the air had been exhausted. After several failures he abandoned his efforts upon the religious grounds that the Almighty doubtless did not approve such an overturning in the affairs of mankind as would follow the attainment of the art of flying. In 1757, Galen, a French monk, published a book, The Art of Navigating in the Air, in which he advocated filling the body of the airship with air secured at a great height above the sea level, where it was a thousand times lighter than water. He showed by mathematical computations that the upward impulse of this air would be sufficient to lift a heavy load. He planned in detail a great airship to carry four million persons and several million packages of goods. Though it may have accomplished nothing more, this book is believed to have been the chief source of inspiration to the Mongolfiers. The discovery of hydrogen by Cavendish in 1776 gave Dr. Black the opportunity of suggesting that it be used to inflate a large bag and so lift a heavy load into the air. Although he made no attempt to construct such an apparatus, he afterward claimed that through this suggestion he was entitled to be called the real inventor of the balloon. This is the meager historical record preceding the achievements of the brothers Stephen and Joseph Mongolfier, which marked distinctly the beginning of practical aeronautics. Both of these men were highly educated, and they were experienced workers in their father's paper factory. Joseph had made some parachute drops from the roof of his house as early as 1771. After many experiments with steam, smoke, and hydrogen gas, with which they tried ineffectually to inflate large paper bags, they finally succeeded with heated air, and on June 5, 1783, they sent up a great paper hot air balloon, 35 feet in diameter. It rose to a height of a thousand feet, but soon came to earth again upon cooling. It appears that the Mongolfiers were wholly ignorant of the fact that it was the rarefying of the air by heating that caused their balloon to rise, and they made no attempt to keep it hot while the balloon was in the air. About the same time, the French scientist, M. Charles, decided that hydrogen gas would be better than hot air to inflate balloons. Finding that this gas passed readily through paper, he used silk coated with a varnish made by dissolving rubber. His balloon was 13 feet in diameter and weighed about 20 pounds. It was sent up from the Champ de Mars on August 29, 1783, amidst the booming of cannon, in the presence of 300,000 spectators who assembled despite a heavy rain. It rose swiftly, disappearing among the clouds, 
and soon burst from the expansion of the gas in the higher and rarer atmosphere, no allowance having been made for this unforeseen result. It fell in a rural region near Paris, where it was totally destroyed by the inhabitants, who believed it to be some hideous form of the devil. The Montgolfiers had already come to Paris, and had constructed a balloon of linen and paper. Before they had opportunity of sending it up, it was ruined by a rainstorm with a high wind. They immediately built another of waterproof linen, which made a successful ascension on September 19, 1783, taking as passengers a sheep, a cock, and a duck. The balloon came safely to earth after being up eight minutes, falling in consequence of a leak in the airbag near the top. The passengers were examined with great interest. The sheep and the duck seemed in the same excellent condition as when they went up, but the cock was evidently ailing. A consultation of scientists was held, and it was the consensus of opinion that the fowl could not endure breathing the rarer air of the high altitude. At this juncture, someone discovered that the cock had been trodden upon by the sheep, and the consultation closed abruptly. The Montgolfier brothers were loaded with honors, Stephen receiving the larger portion, and the people of Paris entered enthusiastically into the sport of making and flying small balloons of the Montgolfier type. Stephen began work at once upon a larger balloon intended to carry human passengers. It was 50 feet in diameter, and 85 feet high, with a capacity of 100,000 cubic feet. The car for the passengers was swung below from cords in the fashion that has since become so familiar. In the meantime, Pilatre de Rosia had constructed a balloon on the hot air principle, but with an arrangement to keep the air heated by a continuous fire in a pan under the mouth of the balloon. He made the first balloon ascent on record on October 15, 1783, rising to a height of 80 feet in the captive balloon. On November 21st, in the same year, de Rosier undertook an expedition in a free balloon with the Marquis de Arlandes as a companion. The experiment was to have been made with two condemned criminals, but de Rosier and de Arlandes succeeded in obtaining the king's permission to make the attempt, and in consequence their names remain as those of the first aeronauts. They came safely to the ground after a voyage lasting twenty-five minutes. After this, ascension speedily became a recognized sport, even for ladies. The greatest altitude reached by these hot-air balloons was about 9,000 feet. The great danger from fire, however, led to the closer consideration of the hydrogen balloon of Professor Charles, who was building one of 30 feet diameter for the study of atmospheric phenomena. His mastery of the subject is shown by the fact that his balloon was equipped with almost every device afterward in use by the most experienced aeronauts. He invented the valve at the top of the bag for allowing the escape of gas in landing, the open neck to permit expansion, the network of cords to support the car, the grapnel for anchoring, and the use of a small pilot balloon to test the air currents before the ascension. He also devised a barometer by which he was able to measure the altitude reached by the pressure of the atmosphere. To provide the hydrogen gas required, he used the chemical method of pouring dilute sulfuric acid on iron filings. The process was so slow that it took continuous action for three days and three nights to secure the 14,000 cubic feet needed, but his balloon was finally ready on December 1, 1783. One of the brothers Robert accompanied Charles, and they traveled about 40 miles in a little less than four hours, alighting at Nesle. Here Robert landed, and Charles continued the voyage alone. Neglecting to take on board ballast to replace the weight of M. Robert, Charles was carried to a great height, and suffered severely from cold and the difficulty of breathing in the highly rarefied air. He was obliged to open his gas valve and descend after half an hour's flight alone. Blanchard, another French inventor, about this time constructed a balloon with the intention of being the first to cross the English Channel in the air. He took his balloon to Dover, and with Dr. Jeffries, an American, started on January 7, 1785. His balloon was leaky, and he had loaded it down with a lot of useless things in the way of oars, provisions, and other things. All of this material and the ballast had to be thrown overboard at the outset, and books and parts of the balloon followed. Even their clothing had to be thrown over to keep the balloon out of the sea, and at last, when Dr. Jeffries had determined to jump out to enable his friend to reach the shore, an upward current of wind caught them, and with great difficulty they landed near Calais. The feat was highly lauded, and a monument in marble was erected on the spot to perpetuate the record of the achievement. Dr. Rosier lost his life soon after in the effort to duplicate this trip across the channel with his combination hydrogen and hot air balloon. 
His idea seems to have been that he could preserve the buoyancy of his double balloon by heating up the air balloon at intervals. Unfortunately, the exuding of the hydrogen as the balloons rose formed an explosive mixture with the air he was rising through, and it was drawn to his furnace, and an explosion took place which blew the entire apparatus into fragments at an altitude of over 1,000 feet. Count Zembicari, an Italian, attempted to improve the Derezier method of firing a balloon by substituting a large alcohol lamp for the wood fire. In the first two trial trips he fell into the sea, but was rescued. On the third trip his balloon was swept into a tree, and the overturned lamp set it on fire. To escape being burned, he threw himself from the balloon, and was killed by the fall. The year before these feats on the continent, two notable balloon ascensions had taken place in England. On August 27, 1784, an aeronaut by the name of Tiddler made the first balloon voyage within the boundaries of Great Britain. His balloon was of linen and varnished, and the record of his ascension indicates that he used hydrogen gas to inflate it. He soared to a great height and descended safely. A few weeks later, the Italian aeronaut Lunardi made his first ascent from London. The spectacle drew the king and his counselors from their deliberations, and the balloon was watched until it disappeared. He landed in Standon, near Ware, where a stone was set to record the event. On October 12th, he made his famous voyage from Edinburgh over the Firth or Forth to Ceres, a distance of 46 miles in 35 minutes, or at the rate of nearly 79 miles per hour, a speed rarely equaled by the swiftest railroad trains. From this time on, balloons multiplied rapidly, and the ascents were too numerous for recording in these pages. The few which have been selected for mention are notable either for the great distances traversed, or for the speed with which the journeys were made. It should be borne in mind that the fastest method of land travel in the early part of the period covered was by stagecoach, and the sailing ship was the only means of crossing the water. It is no wonder that often the people among whom the aeronauts landed on a balloon voyage refused to believe the statements made as to the distance they had come, and the marvelously short time it had taken. And even as compared with the most rapid transit of the present day, the speeds attained in many cases have never been equaled. A remarkable English voyage was made in June, 1802, by the French aeronaut Garnerin and Captain Snowden. They ascended from Chelsea Gardens and landed in Colchester, 60 miles distant, in 45 minutes, an average speed of 80 miles an hour. On December 16, 1804, Garnerin ascended from the square in front of Notre Dame, Paris, passing over France and into Italy, sailing above St. Peter's at Rome and the Vatican, and descending into Lake Bracciano, a distance of 800 miles in 20 hours. This voyage was made as a part of the coronation ceremonies of Napoleon I. The balloon was afterwards hung up in a corridor of the Vatican. On October 7, 1811, Sadler and Bircham voyaged from Birmingham to Boston, England, 112 miles in 1 hour 40 minutes, a speed of 67 miles per hour. On November 17, 1836, Charles Green and Monk Mason started on a voyage in the great balloon of the Vauxhall Gardens. It was pear-shaped, 60 feet high and 50 feet in diameter, and held 85,000 cubic feet of gas. It was cut loose at half-past one in the afternoon, and in three hours had reached the English Channel, and in one hour more had crossed it, and was nearly over Calais. During the night it floated on over France in pitchy darkness and such intense cold that the oil was frozen. In the morning the aeronauts descended a few miles from Wilburg in the Duchy of Nassau, having traveled about 500 miles in 18 hours. At that date, by the fastest coaches, the trip would have consumed three days. The balloon was rechristened the Great Balloon of Nassau by the enthusiastic citizens of Wilburg. In 1849, M. Arban crossed the Alps in a balloon, starting at Marseille and landing at Turin, a distance of 400 miles in eight hours. This remarkable record for so long a distance at a high speed has rarely been equaled. It was exceeded as to distance at the same speed by the American aeronaut, John Wise, in 1859. One of the most famous balloons of recent times was the Gant, built by M. Nadar in Paris in 1853. The immense gas bag was made of silk of the finest quality, costing at that time about $1.30 a yard, and being made double, it required 22,000 yards. It had a capacity of 215,000 cubic feet of gas, and lifted four and one-half tons. The car was thirteen feet square, and had an upper deck which was open. 
On its first ascent it carried 15 passengers, including M. Nidar as captain, and the brothers Godard as lieutenants. A few weeks later, this balloon was set free for a long-distance journey, and 17 hours after it left Paris, it landed at Nierburg in Hanover, having traversed 750 miles, a part of the time at the speed of fully 90 miles per hour. In July 1859, John Wise, an American aeronaut, journeyed from St. Louis, Missouri, to Henderson, New York, a distance of 950 miles in 19 hours. His average speed was 50 miles per hour. This record for duration at so high a rate of speed has never been exceeded. During the siege of Paris in 1870, 73 balloons were sent out from that city carrying mail and dispatches. These were under government direction, and received notice in a subsequent chapter devoted to military aeronautics. One of these balloons is entitled to mention among those famous for rapid journeys, having traveled to the Zyder Zee, a distance of 285 miles in three hours, an average speed of 95 miles per hour. Another of these postal balloons belongs in the extreme long-distance class, having come down in Norway nearly 1,000 miles from Paris. In July 1897, the Arctic explorer André started on his voyage to the Pole. As some of his instruments have been recently recovered from a wandering band of Eskimo, it is believed that a record of his voyage may yet be secured. In the same year a balloon under the command of Godard ascended at Leipzig, and after a wandering journey in an irregular course, descended at Wilna. The distance traveled was estimated at 1,032 miles, but as balloon records are always based on the airline distance between the places of ascent and descent, this record has not been accepted as authoritative. The time consumed was 24 and one quarter hours. In 1899, Captain von Zigsfield, Captain Hildebrandt, and a companion started from Berlin in a wind so strong that it prevented the taking on of an adequate load of ballast. They rose into a gale, and in two hours were over Breslau, having made the distance at a speed of 92 miles per hour. In the grasp of the storm, they continued their swift journey, landing finally high up in the snows of the Carpathian Alps in Austria. They were arrested by the local authorities as Russian spies, but succeeded in gaining their liberty by telegraphing to an official more closely in touch with the aeronautics of the day. In 1900, there were several balloon voyages notable for their length. Jacques Balsan traveled from Vicennes to Zantzig, 757 miles. Count de Lavaux journeyed from Vincennes to Poland, 706 miles. Jacques Faure from Vincennes to Memlady, 753 miles. In a subsequent voyage, Jacques Balsan traveled from Vincennes to Rodum in Russia, 843 miles, in 27 and one-half hours. One of the longest balloon voyages on record in point of time consumed is that of Dr. Wegener of the Observatory at Lindenburg in 1905. He remained in the air for 52 and three-quarters hours. The longest voyage as to distance up to 1910 was that of Count de Lavaux and Count Castillon de Saint-Victor in 1906 in the balloon Centaur. This was a comparatively small balloon, having a capacity of only 55,000 cubic feet of gas. The start was made from Vincennes on October 9th, and the landing at Korostyshev in Russia on October 11th. The airline distance traveled was 1,193 miles in 35 and three-quarters hours. The balloon Centaur was afterward purchased by the Aero Club of America and has made many voyages in this country. The Federation Aeronautique Internationale, an association of the aeronauts of all nations, was founded in 1905. One of its functions is an annual balloon race for the International Challenge Cup, presented to the association by James Gordon Bennett, to be an object for competition until won three times by someone competing national club. The first contest took place in September 1906 and was won by the American competitor, Lieutenant Frank P. Lam, with a voyage of 402 miles. The second contest was from St. Louis, Missouri, in 1907. There were three German, two French, one English, and three American competitors. The race was won by Oscar Erbslow, one of the German competitors, with an airline voyage of 872 and one quarter miles, landing at Bradley Beach, New Jersey. Alfred Leblanc, now a prominent aviator, was second with a voyage of 867 miles, made in 44 hours. He also landed in New Jersey. The third race started at Berlin in October 1908, and was won by the Swiss balloon Helvetia, piloted by Colonel Schick, 
which landed in Norway after having been seventy-four hours in the air, and covering a journey of seven hundred and fifty miles. This broke the previous duration record made by Dr. Wegener in 1905. The fourth contest began on October 3, 1909, from Zurich, Switzerland. There were 17 competing balloons, and the race was won by E. W. Mix, representing the Aero Club of America, with a voyage of 589 miles. The fifth contest began at St. Louis, October 17, 1910. It was won by Alan P. Hawley and Augustus Post, with the America II. They traveled 1,355 miles in 46 hours, making a new world's record for distance. Among other notable voyages may be mentioned that of the fielding in a race of July 4, 1908, from Chicago. The landing was made at West Shefford, Quebec, the distance traveled being 895 miles. In November of the same year, A. E. Gaudron, Captain Melan, and C. C. Turner made the longest voyage on record from England. They landed at Mateki Derevny, in Russia, having traveled 1,117 miles in 31 and one-half hours. They were driven down to the ground by a severe snowstorm. On December 31, 1908, M. Yusueli, in the balloon Ruenzori, left the Italian lakes and passed over the Alps at a height of 14,750 feet, landing in France. This feat was followed a few weeks later, February 9, 1909, by Oscar Erbslow, who left St. Moritz with three passengers, crossing the Alps at an altitude of 19,000 feet, and landed at Budapest after a voyage of 33 hours. Many voyages over and among the Alps have been made by Captain Spelterini, the Swiss aeronaut, and he has secured some of the most remarkable photographs of the mountain scenery in passing. In these voyages at such great altitudes, it is necessary to carry cylinders of oxygen to provide a suitable air mixture for breathing. In one of his recent voyages, Captain Spelterini had the good fortune to be carried almost over the summit of Mont Blanc. He ascended with three passengers at Chamonix, and landed at Lake Maggiore seven hours later, having reached the altitude of 18,700 feet, and traveled 93 miles. In the United States, there were several balloon races during the year 1909, the most important being the St. Louis Centennial Race, beginning on October 4th. Ten balloons started. The race was won by S. von Fuhl, who covered the distance of 550 miles in 40 hours, 40 minutes. Clifford B. Harmon and Augustus Post in the balloon New York made a new duration record for America of 48 hours, 26 minutes. They also reached the highest altitude attained by an American balloon, 24,200 feet. On October 12th, in a race for the Lam Cup, a. Holland Forbes and Colonel Max Fleischmann won. They left St. Louis, Missouri, and landed 19 hours and 15 minutes later at Beach, Virginia, near Richmond, having traveled 697 miles. In 1910, in the United States, a remarkable race with 13 competitors started at Indianapolis. This was the elimination race for the international race on October 17th. It was won by Alan P. Hawley and Augustus Post in the balloon America II. They crossed the Allegheny Mountains at an elevation of about 20,000 feet and landed at Warrington, Virginia, after being 44 hours 30 minutes in the air, and descended only to escape being carried out over Chesapeake Bay. In recent years, the greatest height reached by a balloon was attained by the Italian aeronauts Piacenza and Mina in the Albatross on August 9, 1909. They went up from Turin to the altitude of 30,350 feet. The world's height record rests with Professors Burson and Suring of Berlin, who on July 31, 1901, reached 35,500 feet. The record of 37,000 feet claimed by Glacier and Coxwell in their ascension of September 5, 1862, has been rejected as not authentic for several discrepancies in their observations, and on the ground that their instruments were not of the highest reliability. As they carried no oxygen, and reported that for a time they were both unconscious, it is estimated that the highest point they could have reached under the conditions was less than 31,000 feet. The greatest speed ever recorded for any balloon voyage was that of Captain von Ziegsfeld and Dr. Link in their fatal journey from Berlin to Antwerp, during which the velocity of 125 miles per hour was recorded. Ballooning as a sport has a fascination all its own. There is much of the spice of adventure in the fact that one's destiny is quite unknown. Floating with the wind, 
there is no consciousness of motion. Though the wind may be traveling at great speed, the balloon seems to be in a complete calm. A lady passenger, writing of a recent trip, has thus described her experience. The world continues slowly to enroll itself in ever-varying but ever-beautiful panorama. Patchwork fields, shimmering silver streaks, toy box churches and houses, and white roads like the joints of a jigsaw puzzle. And presently cotton wool billows come creeping up, with purple shadows and fleecy outlines and prismatic rainbow effects. Sometimes they invade the car and shroud it for a while in clinging warm white wreaths, and anon they fall below and shut out the world with a glorious curtain. And we are all alone in perfect silence, in perfect peace, and in a realm made for us alone. And so the happy, restful hours go smoothly by until the earth has had enough of it, and rising up more or less rapidly to invade our solitude, hits the bottom of our basket, and we step out, or maybe roll out, into everyday existence a hundred miles away. The perfect smoothness of motion, the absolute quiet, and the absence of distracting apparatus combine to render balloon voyaging the most delightful mode of transit from place to place. Some of the most fascinating bits of descriptive writing are those of aeronauts. The following quotation from the report of Captain A. Hildebrandt of the Balloon Corps of the Prussian Army will show that although his expeditions were wholly scientific, he was far from indifferent to the sublimer influences of nature by which he was often surrounded. In his account of the journey from Berlin to Marguerite in Sweden, with Professor Burson as a companion aeronaut, he says, The view over Rudin and the chalk cliffs of Steubenkammer and Arcona was splendid. The atmosphere was perfectly clear. On the horizon we could see the coasts of Sweden and Denmark, looking almost like a thin mist. East and west there was nothing but the open sea. About 3.15 the balloon was in the middle of the Baltic. Right in the distance we could just see Rügen and Sweden. The setting of the sun at 4 p.m. was a truly magnificent spectacle. At a height of 5,250 feet, in a perfectly clear atmosphere, the effect was superb. The blaze of color was dimly reflected in the east by streaks of a bluish green. I have seen sunsets over France at heights of 10,000 feet, with the Alps, the Huras, and the Vosges Mountains in the distance, but this was quite as fine. The sunsets seen by the mountaineer or the sailor are doubtless magnificent, but I hardly think the spectacle can be finer than that spread out before the gaze of the balloonist. The impression is increased by the absolute stillness which prevails. No sound of any kind is heard. As soon as the sun went down, it was necessary to throw out some ballast, owing to the decrease of temperature. We reached the Swedish coast about five o'clock, and passed over Trelleborg at a height of two thousand feet. The question then arose whether to land or to continue through the night. Although it was well past sunset, there was sufficient light in consequence of the snow to see our way to the ground, and to land quite easily. However, we wanted to do more meteorological work, and it was thought that there was still sufficient ballast to take us up to a much greater height. We therefore proposed to continue for another sixteen hours during the night, in spite of the cold. Malmo was therefore passed on the left, and the university town of Lund on the right. After this the map was of no further use, as it was quite dark and we had no lamp. The whole outlook was like a transformation scene. Floods of light rose up from Trelleborg, Malmo, Copenhagen, Landskrona, Lund, Elsinore, and Helsingborg, while the little towns beneath our feet sparkled with many lights. We were now at a height of more than 10,000 feet, and consequently all these places were within sight. The glistening effect of the snow was heightened by the blaze which poured from the lighthouses along the coasts of Sweden and Denmark. The sight was as wonderful as that of the sunset, though of a totally different nature. Captain Hildebrand's account of the end of this voyage illustrates the spice of adventure which is likely to be encountered when the balloon comes down in a strange country. It has its hint also of the hardships for which the venturesome aeronaut has to be prepared. He says, Sooner or later the balloon would have been at the mercy of the waves. The valve was opened, and the balloon descended through the thick clouds. We could see nothing, but the little jerks showed us that the guide rope was touching the ground. In a few seconds we saw the ground, and learned that we were descending into a forest which enclosed a number of small lakes. At once more ballast was thrown out, and we skimmed along over the tops of the trees. Soon we crossed a big lake, and saw a place that seemed suitable for a descent. The valve was then opened, both of us gave a tug at the ripping cord, and after a few bumps we found ourselves on the ground. We had come down in deep snow on the side of a wood, about fourteen miles from the railway station at Marcred. We packed up our instruments, and began to look out for a cottage, but this is not always an easy task in the dead of night in a foreign country. However, in a quarter of an hour we found a farm, and succeeded in rousing the inmates. 
a much more difficult job was to influence them to open their front door to two men who talked some sort of double dutch and who suddenly appeared at a farmyard miles off the highway in the middle of the night and demanded admittance burson can talk in six languages but unfortunately swedish is not one of them he begged in the most humble way for shelter and at the end of three quarters of an hour the farmer opened the door we showed him some pictures of a balloon we had with us and then they began to understand the situation we were then received with truly swedish hospitality and provided with supper they even proposed to let us have their beds but this we naturally declined with many thanks the yard contained hens pigs cows and sheep but an empty corner was found which was well packed with straw and served as a couch for our tired limbs we covered ourselves with our greatcoats and tried to sleep but the temperature was ten degrees fahrenheit and as the place was only an outhouse of boards roughly nailed together and the wind whistling through the cracks and crevices we were not sorry when the daylight came lest the possibility of accident to travelers by balloon be judged greater than it really is it may be well to state that records collected in germany in nineteen o six showed that in two thousand and sixty one ascents in which seventy thousand five hundred and seventy persons participated only thirty six were injured or but one out of two hundred and ten since that time while the balloon itself has remained practically unchanged better knowledge of atmospheric conditions has aided in creating an even more favorable record for recent years that the day of ordinary ballooning has not been dimmed by the advent of the airship and the aeroplane is evidenced by the recently made estimate that not less than eight hundred spherical balloons are in constant use almost daily in one part or another of christendom and it seems entirely reasonable to predict that with a better comprehension of the movements of air currents to which special knowledge the scientific world is now applying its investigations as never before, they will come a great increase of interest in simple ballooning as a recreation. End of chapter 13